Well, welcome. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, and well done the 70 something of you who are still going strong um, after um, an amazing day. Um, what a remarkable collection of presentations from across the globe, lots of different perspectives. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it sitting here in Edinburgh. It's been lovely to see you all. It would have been even more lovely if we were all there in person, but it is still lovely to see you. Um, so I am going to start um, by, first of all, um, saying particular personal thanks um, to Harry Cheng, who has organised us. Um, this panel, we are an unmanageable panel. We're going to, we're going to do our best to um, do what we should be doing, but Harry um, has had to manage us, which he has done beautifully. And also for um, Jerigo Escalar, who um, I know has done an enormous amount of work to pull this together. Um, I cannot quite imagine what it must have involved to get everybody coordinated enough to do talks and so on. So um, my personal thanks and congratulations in partic particular go to both of you as well as everybody else um, at the PB. Um, so I am not going to talk for too long because we have an amazing panel of five people here. Um, the one thing that um, I am going to say is I am here because of my, um, in my capacity as a fellow of the IAFL, and we also, on behalf of the IAFL, send our congratulations for such a fabulous conference and for all the work that's gone into it. Um, we have, it, today, or not today, this year was our 35th birthday, so we are 10 years older than the 96th convention, um, but we are very much aligned um, in terms of uh, the work that we regard as important and um, we see uh, all that you do with a tiny, tiny um, resource um, to make the world a better place. So congratulations and thanks also from the IFL. So what we are going to do just now, we have a panel of five, as you can see. Um, each of the panellists are going to just take a few moments to introduce themselves, tell you a bit about what they do um, and to talk a little bit about the interaction they have or not with the 1996 convention. Then Henry is going to give us a very quick whistle-stop tour of what the convention is um, and why it has importance, um, because we understand that this particular recording needs to be viewed effectively as a standalone piece for people who've not been able to watch um, all of the various presentations. Um, and then we are going to dangerously move into unscripted territory um, and see where we go. Um, I have some questions ready if everybody goes quiet, um, but I have a feeling that that may not happen, um, having uh, met these five, and I think we'll do fine to use our time. So we're going to start with, in alphabetical order, um, and I'm only doing alphabetical order because that means that the two women on this panel get to go first. Um, so we're going to start with uh, Mia Dambach. Mia, introduce yourself and um, tell us who you are, what you do, and your interest in the 96th Convention. Okay, um, thanks Rachel for that introduction and it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Thank you to the Hague Conference on Private International Law for allowing me to be part of these celebrations and this milestone, these 25 years. I'm really excited about the next 25 years and the opportunities that the 1996 Hague Child Protection Convention offers, given the current needs that we have in the world and the current movement of children across borders. I um, briefly, because we were asked to start with who we are, I, I was originally a children's lawyer in Australia, uh, moved to Switzerland um, and have been working in child protection for now tw 20 years, so that makes me quite old, um, but young in heart. Um, and the issue of cross-border child protection has been something I've been working on particularly for the last 15 years. It's something that I think is very important in terms of the work that I've done in about 30 different countries, whether it be evaluation missions, training or law reform. And in my current position as um, Executive Director for Child Identity Protection, um, the issue of cross-border child protection has followed me to this um, position. And I think it's important because when we talk about child protection, we've always, as a sector, been focusing on 
immediate security needs of the child, placing them in a safe environment. And what we've done less is preserving the continuity of the child's identity and making sure that their cultural, ethnic, religious, linguistic identity issues, that there's continuity, not just within a country context, but across borders. And the 1996 Hague Convention, um, Child Protection Convention, gives us an opportunity to align public international law and private international law in a way that holistically protects the child. So I really think that there is a bright future um, to make sure that we provide children in cross-border sections um, situations this holistic approach. Yeah, that was amazing and perfect. Thank you. So um, our next panellist um, is Petra Hubava from the Czech Republic. Now, I, I was saying to the panel earlier on that I'm extraordinarily bad at anything um, that isn't kind of English, but with a Scottish accent. Um, so I'm not going to try and say where you are, Petra, because it is the second um, city of the Czech Republic, but it comes out as Brno for me, which I don't think is right. So tell us who you are, um, where you're from and what you do. That was fairly close. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, uh, wherever you uh, may be. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, actually speak today because I'm honoured and humbled at the same time uh, to be amongst uh, these wonderful people. Uh, so uh, I'm a lawyer. Uh, a legal counsel and uh, a mediator, and I work for the Office for International Legal Protection of Children, which uh, is, amongst many others, uh, the central authority under the 96 Hague Convention. Uh, but in general, uh, our authority, we uh, kind of specialize of uh, anything that uh, concerns the children cross-border protection, so uh, we do a variety, uh, it's a variety of issues, including child detection, intern country adoption. Uh, we're the member of the International Social Service. Um, and as well, we are actually part of the domestic uh, social services, so child protection services. So we get the perspective from the domestic point of view, from the international point of view, and at the same time we get to litigate at court, or litigate, uh, we represent the children uh, in mainly the parental responsibility cases, but also with the placement cases with the external family. So uh, I believe I'm in this panel more uh, as the practical user of the Hague Conventions uh, and I can say that uh, as, a, as a case worker uh, I get to deal with lots of countries uh, which vary in terms of how many uh, legal instruments I can use in order to communicate with my colleagues abroad and uh, especially the 96 and 80 conventions, they are uh, definitely improving my uh, work life. And they make it much easier for the, even for the parents and for uh, everyone we come into contact. So I guess, thank you. That's fabulous, Petra, thank you very much. And I have um, some questions about how things work um, practically for you to come. So we will come on to that. Um, so next of all, um, can I get my um, my arithmetic, not my arithmetic, my alphabet in the right order. Next of all, we are staying on the east uh, or the east to east of me. Um, so we have um, Michal Kowalski um, from, uh, I think you're in Warsaw, aren't you? Are you in Warsaw, Michal? Yes. So over to you, Michal. Tell us about you and what you do. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I am indeed uh, in Warsaw, uh, Warszawa in Polish. Uh, I work uh, for the Commissioner for Human Rights. 
uh, which is uh, the office, uh, an ombudsman's office. If you are familiar with the uh, idea of an ombudsman, that's the Polish uh, ombudsman office. I work here for, uh, well, 19 years now, uh, right after studies, I came uh, to the office and uh, I deal with family law cases uh, since the beginning. We have quite a lot uh, of um, 1980 Hague Convention, Child Abduction Convention cases, uh, and uh, some of them, of course, are dealt with uh, uh, by the uh, Brussels 2A uh, uh, regulation as a complementary to, uh, to Hague uh, Child Abduction, Abduction Conven uh, Convention. So, uh, as I told uh, Rachel before, I do not have much experience with the 1996 uh, Hague Convention, but uh, for at least two reasons, which I, I think will come up uh, later, I think uh, for at least two reasons, uh, it will change and uh, it will be more uh, uh, familiar to Polish uh, lawyers, Polish uh, courts and officials in years to come. Uh, so yes, I, I think that's for the introduction. I think that's uh, that's enough for me. Thank you. Perfect, Michal. And that's a very good way of doing it. Just leave them hanging, <laughs> wanting to know what is it that's different. Very good. You've done this before, I can tell. <laughs> so next, we are going to move on to Henry Setright QC, um, who um, doesn't really need any introduction. Um, so I'm going to let him do his own introduction rather than introducing him. So Henry, you are the penultimate panellist. So tell us who you are, what you do and your interest in the 96. Well, thank you very much. And we enter immediately into the dangerous unscripted territory. That introduction, Rachel, reminds me and possibly any English observers of the introduction to a programme called Blind Date on television, which is where the presenter used to say, tell us who you are and where you come from. Um, but this is different, and I'm delighted to be here, not on blind date, but at the Hague Conference. Um, and my name is Henry Setright. I'm English Queen's Council. I've been English Queen's Council now for 20 years this year. And before that, for a very long time, um, I was a junior at the Bar of England, and I've been doing Hague Convention cases, of one kind or another, ever since. The 1980 convention came into force in England and Wales, which was in um, 1986, um, and that is a very long time ago. And my practice has developed to include, as they came along, um, the um, 1996, um, which has been in force in England for, I think, um, nearly 10 years, and um, the 2000 um, Hague Convention, um, which we use um, uh, in international cases involving um, medical me medical cases. Um, and I can say that these cases, these cases which are international children's cases, have taken me relatively regularly to the United Kingdom Supreme Court. They've also taken me to the Court of Justice of the European Union, um, to the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg and on two memorable occasions with the collaboration of a, a, an American team um, to Amicus Briefs on Hague Convention cases in the United States Supreme Court. So I've got a bit of a worldwide outlook, um, even though I don't like to stir from my home base in London. Um, and so for me, international collaboration, international conventions and regulations are really important. And in a few minutes, I'll be able to say a little bit about this 1996 Hague Convention and how recent historical events have meant that England, the United Kingdom, in, in deference to someone else on this panel, the United Kingdom is probably going to bring the 1996 to Europe in ways they never expected. But that's enough for me for the moment. I think you and Mikhail have been um, collaborating with all of this, this little sort of tasters of things to come. This is getting better and better. Um, so no pressure, 
Now over to Daniel. Um, Daniel, you uh, your surname begins with a T, so I'm afraid you're the fifth one. We don't have anybody who has a, a, a later a later letter than that. Um, but I think it's probably the earliest in the morning for you because you are joining us um, from Uruguay. So again, handing over to you. Where are you from, and what do you do, and what's your involvement with the 96? Thank you, Rachel, for your introduction, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Permanent Bureau for the opportunity to address all of you on such an important occasion when we gather all together to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the 96 Child Protection Convention. Uh, my name is Daniel Dreka and I am the head of the Uruguayan Central Authority of International Legal Cooperation, where I've been working for 17 years. This office is the designated central authority for every single convention that is Uruguay has signed, both civil and criminal, with the only exception on, on matters of adoption. Therefore, we are the designated central authority under the 1996 convention. I'm a, also a system professor in private international law in two universities in Uruguay. So my interest in the convention is both academic and practical. Although it may seem that 25 years is a long period of time for a convention, this is really not. And we are still in front of a very young convention, a very modern and up-to-date convention. But for a country that is a contracting state since 2009, today is a great opportunity to spread the benefits of becoming of the, uh, a party of the 1996 convention, as has been highlighted during all this event. Spreading the benefits of becoming a contracting state is something I believe that every single contracting state should do in order to help other countries that maybe are hesitating about it to finally decide to become a party. And really that's not a very hard uh, work to do because the convention make it easier. It makes it easy because it's an excellent convention that deals with everything that has to be dealt with in order to protect our children's rights. From the German jurisdiction on this matter, uh, to establish the applicable law, the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgment, and establish a cooperation network that make it possible. So it's really, really a pleasure to join you in this panel when we will try to foresee the impact of the convention will, uh, that the, this convention will have 25 years ahead when it reads its 50th anniversary, and I firmly believe it's going to fulfill its potential. And back to you, Rachel. Perfect, Daniel. So I, after we have heard from Henry, I've got a question. I'm going to start with a question for you. So I'm going to, as I warn you, I'm, I'm doing a Michael Henry, giving you a little taster, but not telling you what it is yet. Um, so let's um, hand back to Henry. So Henry, give us a, a whistle stop um, overview um, for people who haven't been able to watch all of the presentations so far. What are the headlines that we need to know about the convention, what it is, what it does, and how it works? Uh, well, well, Rachel, uh, what I, I, something I didn't say in my introduction was that before I came to the bar, I taught history. So here's some history, because actually putting this um, convention into context helps to understand why it happened. Um, and why it's needed. Um, and it goes back further probably than anybody um, realizes. Um, it goes back to something called the 1902 Convention on Guardianship of Minors, um, which then led to the um, 1961 Convention on the Powers of Authorities and Law Applicable in Respect to the Protection of Infants, known um, more conveniently as the 1961 Hague Convention. And then things went quiet for a bit on the convention front until in 1980, this hugely successful worldwide convention on child abduction was developed, which allows for the return of children um, in a fairly shorthand way with relatively simple tests, um, but it's a relatively blunt instrument. It's you succeed or you fail. There is a summary return of an abducted child or there is not. And so it's a relatively blunt instrument, albeit a very successful one. Its take up is wide, massive numbers of countries operated. Um, but as soon as it came into force, it highlighted a need for something better, which allowed 
the broader protection of children by having a harmonization internationally of jurisdiction. So that's the first thing that it does. It provides that there is a test to demonstrate which territorial jurisdiction is the one that operates when matters concerning a child have to be litigated. And the key to that is, with some let outs, the habitual residence of the subject child. So there is a jurisdictional rule and that meshes with the 1980 Hague Convention. Then the 1996 deals with applicable law. That's not always the headline point of this particular convention, but it's technical and it should mean that there aren't any questions or dispute as to which country's law, as distinct from which jurisdiction, applies in particular circumstances. And that can apply to questions of status for parents, carers and others. Then, most importantly, and again adjunctively to the 1980 Hague Convention, it deals with recognition and enforcement. Gone are the days, hopefully, where you can flee from an order made in country A to country B and say, come on, judge in country B, start again. I'm not even going to tell you about the order in country A. I'm here. I'm going to do as I please. Um, not only is there a jurisdictional conformity, so you, you can't do that, you can't forum shop, but also the person with the order in country A can enforce it in country B under the 1996 by a fairly shorthand process with simple defences. And finally, finally, um, there's cooperation. And that's a bit of a Cinderella for the 1996, but not for me, I can tell you, um, because that is the really protective part in many ways of this convention, because it means that state bodies and authorities within the state, including public local authorities and persons with a responsibility for child care and child protection can and must collaborate internationally. And the scope of that is at the moment not completely explored and exploited. That's what it does. But what is very interesting about it is that after it was produced in, believe it or not, 1996, the European states rather took it over. They devised the EU states, their own version. In some ways, dare I say it, and, and this is not me revisiting old political battles, in some ways it was an improved version of the 1996. In some others, it doesn't go as far. And it was called the Brussels II regulation, and it became the Brussels IIA, or BIS, or revised regulation. And that became the single standard for the European countries, apart from Denmark, um, and by something called Article 61 and 62, they said, right, where B2A operates, the 1996 cannot. And so the European states had very little experience, but they had experience of something almost exactly the same. And so we are used in the countries of Europe, although my country is no longer technically one of them, um, to operating the 1996 without operating it. So we're used to having jurisdictional conformity. We're used to having recognition and enforcement. Um, but what we now have is a situation where in England, after Brexit, we will no longer be able to operate once existing cases run out, B2A. So it's the 1996 in our relations with the EU countries. And suddenly for us, it's taken off. Now, we have done lots of cases on the 1996 before. I've done cases involving, for example, Morocco which have tested out the extent of Article 11, and on Switzerland, which have tested out um, 
some of the aspects of um, Articles 8 and 9, which is the transfer of jurisdiction. And what these show is it's a really sophisticated, comprehensive instrument, which is capable of doing any number of things far more than a casual um, glance would suggest. That, I think, is probably my five minutes of introduction on what it does. But goodness, I'm afraid, I'm very sorry to say, Rachel, I could have taken five hours and still not have finished. Henry, that was masterful. Thank you. But I think that's, that's a good way to open the panel up, because I think what we have been asked to do here is to look at where we are at at 25 years, but with an eye to where we will be in another 25. And I think, um, Mia, you touched on some of the areas in terms of identity that have not yet been fully explored. You know, Henry, you talked there about some of the other areas where there is a lot still to be done in particularly cooperation and so on. So I think um, we can maybe touch on some of the things that we think might come as much as some of the things that we are currently doing when we start talking. So Henry, fabulous, thank you. Um, so I'm going to kick off with a question for Daniel um, because I want to start with a bit of the practical stuff about how this is actually operated. And um, Daniel, when um, Nieve was speaking earlier on for Buenos Aires, um, I scribbled down that I think in the body of South America, we've got Uruguay, Ecuador, Guyana and Paraguay, I think, but that's all um, who are currently operating the 96. So you are kind of a little island in a sea of big bits of territory. Um, where, you know, some of the big countries like Argentina and Brazil and Chile um, who are not signatories. So from your perspective as a central authority, um, what is it about the 96 Convention that is helpful? What do, what do your citizens get being citizens of a country that is operating the 96 as opposed to if they were a citizen of Chile or whatever? Can you talk us through what that's like a bit? Well, that's a really good question, Rachel. As you know, uh, 53 states are already a contracting state of the convention. But uh, as as you look in on a map, uh, on a map, you can you can say that the convention is still a very European convention, as most of the contracting states are from Europe. Um, and as Henry said, it's also like uh, quite paradoxical because although mostly of all countries in Europe are contracting states of the convention, they don't use it, this convention because they have their own European revolution uh, on this matter. And now, as Henry has pointed out, we usually will sh start to see more cases with the UK after the Brexit. But as you say, unfortunately, uh, it's, that's not the case in the American continent yet. Uh, in 2009, Uruguay has become the second state in the whole American continent to ratify the convention after Ecuador. And after that, only six, only six other countries in, in America also become a party of the convention, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Honduras, Paraguay, Nicaragua, and most recently, Costa Rica. So as you say, if you look at those countries on a map, we are still like, a, like you say, a small island on a big continent. From our perspective, I believe that that is the main reason why we still cannot say that the convention has reached its full potential. Many of our family cases are related to closer states, as the one you have mentioned, Argentina, Brazil and Chile. With Argentina, for instance, we do have conventional regulation as both countries are contracting state of the 1940 Montevideo Treaty. Mm -hmm. But this treaty is quite different from the 1996 Hague Convention as its solutions are more focused on the parents rather than the child. I, I firmly believe that the, that's one of the main merits of the 1996 Convention, that is a convention that is focused on the child to be protected, assigning the closest jurisdiction possible to the child to make his or her right protected. So it will be extremely beneficial that many more countries become contracting state of the 1996 convention, making its solution the, the standard solution on child protection. And as far as I know, those countries you have mentioned are really considered becoming 
a contracting state as well. I hope they, they do it soon. Nowadays, most of our cases are with uh, European countries and they're mostly related to child abduction cases. The 1996 convention has proven to be the best companion of the 1980 convention. Um, similar to what happened with Brussels too, our domestic law established that even if the return of the child to the state of habitual residence may cause a grave risk of harm, the judge will return the child back to the state of habitual residence if effective measure of protection can be established. If the state of habitual residence of the child is not a contracting state of the 1996 convention, then we need to ask for all the other country to issue, for instance, mirror orders. And in our experience, that's not a very quick and easy method to grant the protection of the child. But on the other hand, if the state habitual residence of the child is a contracting state of the 1996 convention, then it's quite easier because as the judge who is determined whether the child should return or not, can use the jurisdiction in case of urgency established under Article 11 and establish measure of protection that will become effective in all other contracting state, but especially on the state of his or her habitual residence. Another scenario, common scenario are social reports asked by parents who live in a contracting state and the child lives in another and that that parents suspect that the child may not be living in good condition. Under Article 32, we are able to produce those reports and if we finally found out that the child is in need of protection, then procure to establish the necessary measure of protection. Those social reports are also very useful as well in case of relocation of children. Finally, I would like to highlight the need of doing some adjustment to the domestic law of the contracting states, especially in relation to declaring enforceable or registering for the purpose of enforcement a measure of protection issued by a foreign judge. As you know, Article 26 rely on the procedure provided by the domestic law of the state on which we want to enforce the measure of protection. And it says that each contracting state will, shall apply to the declaration of enforceability or registration a simple and rapid procedure. For some countries, a simple and rapid procedure means months or even years. Children cannot wait months or even years for the right to be protected. So if our domestic law cannot provide a solution in a suitable period of time, it's imperative we make the necessary judgment. I believe that there are many things we still need to do to safeguard our children's rights, but I firmly believe that becoming a party of the 1990 Convention surely goes in that direction. When I try to foresee 25 years ahead, I would like to foresee a convention that has reached its full potential. I would like to foresee that the 1996 convention has become the standard solution on child protection as most of the state of the world has become a contracting state. I would like to foresee that those states have established modern domestic law with the special sensibility that is required on this matter in order to ensure the forcibility of the measure of protection in a suitable period of time. But what I really, really want is that I don't have to wait 25, 25 years more to see that happen. That was fabulous, Daniel. Thank you so much. It was brilliant. Um, I want to pick up on one of the things that you touched on there and, and come to Petra, because you again are practical on the ground central authority. Um, and Daniel, you talked there that the second of your points there was about reports. And as Henry said about the, the cooperative co cooperation elements in the convention. Um, Petra, oh, Petra can't hear me. Can anyone else hear me? Yes, everyone. I think it's just you, Petra. Can you hear me? No. Yeah. Uh, so, Have you got sorry. Can yeah, you? I got you. But I didn't hear the question. You didn't hear that. No. What I was going to say, I wanted to come to bring you in now because you know you are also another on the ground central authority person, and I wanted to pull out one of the bits that Daniel talked about there, which was the cooperation mechanisms and <clears throat> obtaining reports. Um, I mean, can you talk us through? I mean, you, as I, I said to you before, um, when we were speaking before this, I was very glad to meet Petra because I was at a conference. I was speaking at a conference many years ago 
and um, there was much discussion um, about this mythical creature that was the perfect central authority, the central authority to end all central authorities. It was the gold standard of all central authorities, which was, well, it was mostly Petra. I'm sure she has colleagues as well. Um, but there was a lot of discussion about just how incredibly well developed the mechanisms and the practical operation of your central authority is. Um, so um, tell us a bit about how that works and particularly how the the report bit and the cooperation mechanisms works and how it works when you've got a 96 state or, or possibly not a 96 state, because I know that within your ambit you have some non-96 states. So tell us a bit about that. Yes, thank you. Well, I certainly have uh, colleagues. I have a number of colleagues, <laughs> uh, to be fair. Uh, and they are definitely part of the success. Uh, because I think that we are very lucky uh, because we get to work in uh, in a team with also with psychologists and with social workers. And it is my firm belief that the child protection and parental uh, conflict cases are the ones which are the hardest to be solved uh, solely by the legal provisions because uh, life uh, is life. And um, again, also to uh, come back, I, I actually made notes uh, what Henry has uh, noted that uh, actually the sharing of information uh, and cooperation of central authorities is the Cinderella of the uh, Hague Convention. But uh, in fact, uh, it, when I was talking to my colleagues about what is their shared experience with, uh, with, the, with the 96 Convention, uh, almost all of them said, yeah, that's the best tool how to share the report on the family situation of the children and or their families. And uh, apparently everything works well because I was asking, so do you have any like um, interesting stories or um, what are the what are our cases to highlight? And I guess that's something maybe that attests to the conventions uh, well-developed mechanism because they said well no everything works perfectly most of the like our counterparts uh, in, with with respect to this specific convention they always respond we get the information uh, and I believe what is very good about this instrument is it provides you with a framework uh, you you know that on the other part uh, on the other side there is going to be someone who speaks at least one language that you both can try to communicate in and you know that they will be able to get you perspective of their own country, of their own cultural approach to the situation. And as I said, we actually we, we really come across very broad range of subjects uh, or very range situation in what the specific child can find himself or herself. And it's very useful, then it's not very constricting about what type of information can we share, what, uh, I don't know, uh, like what is the extent of uh, how we can communicate with each other. And so when we get some non-standard unspecific case and we need uh, some fast solution, it's fairly useful to just reach out to the colleague and to discuss with them what can we do about this. Uh, well, I, I have some practical examples, but I don't want to talk for half an hour just about that. But yes, uh, to coming back to the point of uh, working with or without the convention. Yeah. Um, as, as I have said, we are part of the ISS, so that's usually it's it either coincides. So the um, our colleagues who are a member of the ISS, they are also the central authority uh, under the Hague Convention, uh, or it's usually the only other means of how to get some information from the from the other state. But the, a bit of a downside of this is that even though our colleagues on the other side, uh, uh, our counterparts of the ISS, they want to help us, uh, we sometimes kind of 
encounter the barriers which might be uh, given by the data protection law or personal protection law. And it can be quite frustrating because I believe that in this whole system, the, the central authorities, we are created as kind of a information hubs. This is our greatest value in the whole system because we usually, we are usually the fastest way how to get some uh, or how to get to the solution. And if we really don't have the counterpart or if the system is not very well developed, that can take months, years to get some information or go get to the solution, which uh, kind of uh, really can uh, have a huge impact on the child's life. Just for, like uh, for an example, one of the side effects of the 1980 convention is that there's always the aftermath of the abduction. Usually there is just one part, not just one parent, but one family, which is completely estranged from the, from the child. And in some, usually the most extreme cases in where I don't even want to go into who is to blame or whether it's the system or the parents, but still the child loses significant part of its life and its identity. And sometimes the family has no other means other than to turn to our authority and to request some information, at least some information about the child in terms of whether uh, they are at school, how are they doing, because they necessarily might not have other means how to do that because there are lots of court orders and the situation might have been very heated, uh, criminal charges might have been brought up. But I believe that at least this essential minimum that can be done for the family or for the, for the child as well is to share some sort of information. Fantastic, thank you, Petra. <clears throat> And I mean, it, it's probably worth, I'm conscious that we've not um, brought Mia into this conversation yet, and there's probably lots of bits there that she's itching, itching to get involved in. So I'm going to come back to you with some of these identity and looking at the child's, the protect, the measures of protection in a wider context in a moment. But um, Michael, from your perspective, from a Polish perspective, I don't know if there's anything that you want to pick up on what Petra said in terms of how things operate with you but also do you want to um i'm guessing that that the thing that you were teasing us with was has already been hinted at by henry um so do you want to tell us about what you think the future is going to ho hold for um poland in a way that it maybe hasn't um up until the 31st of december last year We are having a muting issue. Sorry. There you go. That's you. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. I minimized the screen instead of uh, unmuting yeah. myself. Uh, yes, uh, of course, uh, Brexit may be a huge um, factor uh, and may have a huge, a huge uh, impact on the usage of uh, of uh, 1996 uh, Hague Convention in Poland, especially um, because Poles are a uh, a uh, large group uh, still in UK and um, the issue of uh, transnational contacts and transnational um, families, um, either only Polish families in UK or Polish and uh, English or Scottish or uh, Northern Irish uh, families still uh, still on the island. Uh, still uh, can be an issue and because of the Brussels 2A not lo no longer uh, dealing uh, with these cases uh, with UK. Uh, of course, um, the, the Geneva, uh, sorry, <laughs> the Hague Convention 1996 can be a, a winner, uh, so to say, uh, in, this, um, in this campaign. And um, because you know, um, Germany and uh, UK, I think, 
I don't have statistics uh, with me at the moment, but I think Germany and UK are these two uh, European countries where uh, Polish uh, migration was uh, was was the biggest, was the largest. So um, yes, I think it can be as as Henry said uh, before, it can be forced uh, on uh, different countries because uh, there's no um, there is nothing better to use uh, when you are dealing with uh, transnational family uh, cases. And the second um, factor that I mentioned before uh, that can also influence um, the usage of uh, 1996 convention in Poland can be that uh, in 2018 uh, there was a new piece of legislation introduced in Poland uh, which uh, well, it was partly to mostly to introduce uh, uh, some some notions of, of uh, 1980 convention, but also Brussels II, uh, uh, a regulation, but also uh, uh, Hague 1996 convention is mentioned in this piece of legislation. And this piece of legislation is, um, well, what I think can be, uh, sorry, Am I hurt still? Yes, we can hear you and your dog, I think. But don't worry, that's good. When I was speaking with Petra yesterday, I got to see her cat. So if we can introduce any other animals, that's good. Oh, but he's now frozen. Sorry. Oh, you're back. Can you hear me now? <laughs> We've got <Yes>. you back. <laughs> OK, uh, sorry for that. I don't know what happened. Um, well, uh, this uh, piece of legislation introduced uh, specialization of courts in Poland. So right now, uh, with this uh, Hague uh, uh, Convention's abductions, uh, there are only 11 courts dealing with those cases. And there is only one uh, appeal court uh, dealing with appeals. And, uh, and there is also a, a cassation court. So there is a cassation introduced um, in these cases. So uh, what we can look uh, in the future is um, some sort of um, you know specialization of judges also in these cases, and um, some kind of um, unification of uh, jurisprudence in these cases, which is uh, something that we look forward to because it it, uh, it will be useful, and uh, also maybe because of that I'm not sure but maybe because of that, the procedures will take uh, a shorter time to finish. So uh, these are two, I believe, positive aspects of this, uh, of this uh, legislation. And uh, the Cassation Court uh, is a Supreme Court of the Republic of Poland in, in these cases. So um, not, not for three years uh, now, when it was introduced in 2018, so, uh, we don't have uh, much of jurisprudence of the Supreme Court now, but uh, we can look forward to, to having that and to have some sort of um, guidance uh, and uh, also the, the foreign or, or authorities, central authorities may have a clearer view as what to expect from the Polish side um, of these cases. Fantastic, Michal. Um, you just need to watch that Henry doesn't try and move to Poland because he may want to add another another Supreme Court to his CV. I wouldn't. Well, we, <laughs> yeah, we, we have, you know, as you I think you are well aware, we are we have uh, all these you discussions between us between our also a court because we have Supreme Court and we have a tri uh, tri uh, constitutional tribunal and they are also in discussion. Uh, 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 with uh, different political agenda also in the background. So let's not go into that. Yes. I was get, yes, there are issues there that may be beyond the scope of our presentation. Yes. Yes, of course. And if I can uh, add uh, one point, uh, maybe that um, in the past, uh, Polish courts uh, were kind of seen um, by the government, by the Polish government, as too eager to give up uh, Polish citizens, uh, Polish children 
to the courts uh, abroad. And uh, it was used also as a, a political argument against courts. Uh, so uh, we will see what will happen in the future, how this jurisprudence will look like. And um, if the, the, these courts, which are, which are now specialized courts, 11 courts uh, in the country, will use uh, the 1996 convention also uh, more and more eagerly. Fantastic. Thank you, Michal. So, Henry, we need to give you the opportunity now, um, firstly, to tell us that you're going to requalify and um, try and take on a Polish practice. You probably have quite a lot of cases, actually, as matters stand, because I think it was, um, I, I was looking at the figures on this some months ago, but I think of the six million or so people who applied for settled status in the UK post Brexit, so earlier this year in June or so, there was over a million of them were Polish individuals. So you, you, are, you are, of course, right, Rachel, and I think I've got three or four ongoing at the moment. Um, and the, 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 the traffic in terms of international movement between Poland and England, England and Poland is undiminished. It raises one point because Mikhail's comments um, uh, about some internal political criticism um, and your comments about a, a Polish Supreme Court bring me to a remark which um, Sir Matthew Thorpe, who is a massive pioneering figure in, in this field, um, made many years ago about the 1980 Convention. He said it's an international convention without an international court. One of the things about the European system and Brussels 2A was above the national courts. There was and is the Court of Justice of the European Union, which could and did um, resolve um, questions about interpretation so that national idiosyncrasy couldn't overwhelm the appropriate um, ambitions of the international instrument. One of the um, things that perhaps looking forward we can wonder about, although who knows what shape it might take, is whether there can be some international Hague jurisdiction to produce conformity. Everyone's always wanted conformity of operation, the 1980 convention. I'm not sure that the 1996 is amenable to non-conformity, but I think Mikhail's point raises something which should be taken to heart by all of us. Unmute furiously. Um, no, that I mean that's a very interesting one, um, Henry, and it also brings us back to suppose, the extent to which um, we are dealing with states here and the interaction of of states. I, mean, I know you've had um, a really interesting case earlier this year um, about the operation of the convention when it, when it deals with transferring. Um, children from one state to another. Do you want to maybe touch on that before we can allow Mia to finish us with a high with the excitement of all the things that we can come to? But, but tell us a little bit about that. That would be interesting. The public law child protection aspects of the convention, I, I don't I don't resile from saying it's it's a Cinderella area because it's unexploited. It works well, but it's not in the limelight. People don't appreciate it's happening. Um, and just as in the Brussels 2A regulation, there is scope for transferring ongoing public law cases between countries, that is child protection cases. And this was a, a case, this was a Swiss case, where there were arguments either way that the case could be, should be transferred from Switzerland to England or England to Switzerland, and the proceedings were already quite well advanced. What the judge did in the end, um, which was something which accorded with the submissions I'd made on behalf of the public authority that was involved, was to say, well, look, let's leave things as they are, but let us exploit the ability that comedy gives us 
to rely on the Swiss authorities to explore all those matters that the English court and English public authorities would have explored. And so a fairly elaborate order was made with recitals, indicating that information would be passed to the Swiss central authority and to the Swiss public law authority, which in a hybrid way familiar to our European friends, but not familiar in England, has some of the roles of a court in a public law child protection case. And this meant that there'd be a free flow of information, no impediment on protection, um, but there wouldn't be a need for a transfer of jurisdiction. So it's an alternative route. And that I think is, is genuinely groundbreaking. It's taking an inter-jurisdictional dispute potentially and saying, well, let's solve it in an innovative way by information and responsibility transfer rather than the apportionment of litigation. So that was a very interesting case. And it is up on Bailey, which is the digest of English and Irish decisions, which is a very useful recourse for anyone internationally who wants to see what the courts of these islands are doing. Thank you, Henry. And that, I mean, that fits back with what Petra was saying, doesn't it, about if you have a relationship with another state and you have the framework of the 96 that allows the development of relationships which means that you can then deal with those kind of practicalities arising from cases in a way that perhaps would be more difficult if that framework wasn't there. Chapter so, five yeah. goes way beyond central authorities. It embraces all sorts of other authorities. Some of its provisions are mandatory too, and yeah. that is little understood. Yeah. Well, that leads well into you, Mia. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I was conscious from when we spoke about and the, the nature of the work that you do and your history is that what you are encouraging all of us as lawyers to do is to be a bit more creative, look yeah. beyond the things that we have just always done because that's how we do them. Um, and I think you feel that there are a number of respects where the stuff that we can do with the 96 that we have not yet started to do. So can you give us some Give us some ideas um, as we can finish up so that we know what we're going to be looking at in 25 years time. When I, I don't think it will be me sitting here, but I'm, I'm, I'm very sure it won't be my children because they said <laughs> they're not going to be lawyers. Um, but at least some of us might be here in 25 years time. So give us some thoughts about where else we need to go. Sure. Thanks, um, Rachel. I think that what the 1996 um, a Child Protection Convention provides us is a framework to really implement these public international law principles that exist and that all, almost all states have um, ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, for example, and this preservation of information and the transfer of information, which is part of the child's identity, that is one advantage of the Hague the 1996 Hague Child Protection Convention, but also keeping families together, Article 9, facilitating contact between family members across borders, and then also continuity in the child's upbringing, ethnic, religious, cultural and linguistic. And it also, because we've got these authorities, whether it be judicial, administrative, whether it's a central adoption authority, we can also filter out inappropriate child protection measures. So, for example, the Council of Europe in their submission to the Committee on the Rights of the Child for their Day of Daniel discussion, they had pinpointed that some of the states, parties to the Council of Europe were um, making cross-border child protection orders for economic reasons. Um, and that clearly is not in the child's best interest, but a central adoption authority or a judicial authority can quickly filter out those types of decisions and say, hey, that's not going to be in the child's best interests. Then we can also see in terms of the potential for this, in terms of children on the move, like I'm sure that Raquel mentioned this in her presentation earlier today for children on the move. We can see that countries that are experiencing these severe emergency situations where their child protection systems are clearly failing and cannot look after these children. 
to avoid children traveling independently, unaccompanied and dying en route, if we can have recourse to international family kinship care through the 1996 Hague Child Protection Convention, we can really save lives. And there is this massive movement of children across borders. And, and we've got a framework to, to say, to, to put in these checks and balances, is this truly in the child's best interest? Then, of course, also kafala. Um, we can see that we can allow for continuity in the child's upbringing, religion, their culture. If they can't be cared for in um, Sharia law countries, but if there are family members or even um another family, but where there's some continuity and where the child can be cared for. So we really do have these opportunities um, to better protect children. And it is really a Cinderella, I think, this cooperation mechanism. And I really like the way that Daniel said that it forces us to focus on children. And that's what this 1996 Hague Child Protection Convention allows us to do, put them at the centre of all our decision making and make sure that we have this holistic approach. Perfect, Mia, thank you. Harry, we're two minutes over. Um, I don't know whether that's OK, um, but we should probably, until he tells me otherwise, I will. Oh, my, Michal's got a question or a hand up. Michal, go for it. Harry hasn't cut us yes. off. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's not a question, really, but a comment. And um, I wanted to uh, support what uh, Mia said just now, uh, because um, I don't know if it's going to work, but I'm thinking about using uh, the 1996 convention in the case uh, that you may already heard about, about these uh, children on the Polish-Belarusian border, uh, because uh, well, it, it will be, and it will. I think it will be hard because the Polish uh, government uh, claims that they are not on the Polish territory, so it will be hard. But I'm thinking about maybe trying to use uh, 1996 convention in this case, and at least uh, to 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 put it out there and to to um, to to maybe uh, put this idea uh, to 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 these uh, activists on the field that they, maybe they can try to use this convention to help these children on the border. Thank you. Fabulous. Well, at a practical level, I'm sure there are about 70 odd people on this call who would help you. So if you need, if you need people to hold your bag or your coat, I'm there. So you probably would prefer to have Henry doing the talking in court than me, but I can hold bags. I can mm. do that. <laughs> So, Harry, I don't know whether you need us to stop talking now. You probably do. If you would like to keep going. Oh, keep going. Minutes, it's fine. Christ well, Christoph, um, thank you. We can see you. Thank you so much for having us. Um, it has been such a pleasure and such an honour um, that you would have us rounding off such a fabulous day. And um, congratulations again for having such a great team of people surrounding you. You're doing a wonderful job. And I hope that little taster from the practitioners here gives you, you can take that home and know that we really do hugely value everything that you are all doing um, for the people that we're working with because it makes a difference and it's working. And so thank you. Rachel, listen, uh, I am a very happy uh, Secretary General indeed. Uh, happy, yes, because I think this was a wonderful, most informative and uh, very interesting day uh, indeed. Uh, at the end of the day, it's all about communication and exchange of experience. And what we have had today uh, was uh, a lot of just that. And I'm also a very happy SG, yes, because I have a wonderful team around me uh, who, who works tirelessly on, uh, on these uh, important uh, issues. So if I may, uh, Harry, this is now maybe a bit uh, improvised, but uh, at the end of this uh, most fruitful day, uh, all I'm left to do is to say thank you. And it's really, 
uh, a heartfelt uh, thank you to uh, all of you. Uh, but let me start uh, maybe by thanking also, uh, in particular, the Bundesministerium der Justiz uh, und für Verbraucherschutz, the Federal Ministry of Justice and Consumer Protection of the Federal Republic of Germany, for their uh, important financial uh, support of uh, this event. Uh, without them, uh, none of this would have been uh, possible. So, ein großes Dankeschön. Uh, and I also wish to thank the International Academy of Family Lawyers uh, for their uh, continuing uh, interest and uh, support of, uh, of our work. It's uh, always wonderful to, uh, to work with you. Uh, I really want to uh, express a heartfelt uh, thank you very much indeed to all the speakers and panelists uh, and all their staff who supported them in the planning, testing and uh, recording of the videos. You have all done uh, an absolute fantastic uh, job and it's very pleasant indeed to see that all these uh, videos will actually left a mark. and. Uh, will be available there for others uh, to enjoy and, and, and learn from. Uh, so thank you so much indeed for taking the time uh, and for uh, contributing to this uh, really meaningful uh, day. I would also like to thank uh, three of our speakers who also served as judges uh, for the finals of the uh, SA competition and uh, that was you, Rachel, uh, moderator of the panel of the wonderful, excellent panel. Mia, uh, thank you also uh, because you're also a judge in addition to being a, a panelist and Professor Nuria Gonzalez Martin also uh, who uh, equally was a, a speaker uh, earlier uh, today. Uh, I really thank also our colleagues at the PB who uh, judged the media and design competition, Brody, Lidi and uh, Julia. Uh, I think they had also uh, quite a bit of fun uh, looking at the, uh, the various uh, projects that were handed in. Uh, and a big, big uh, thank you to Jerry. A big, big thank you to Jerry for uh, having come up with the idea, really for conceptualizing and, and, and implementing this uh, innovative uh, format and uh, this uh, excellent uh, initiative and for having you know, brought it to fruition. Uh, I think it all worked really very well indeed. Uh, a special thank you also to Harry Cheng, uh, who has worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make all of this uh, possible. Uh, in an earlier stage, helped also by uh, Raquel Salinas uh, Peixoto, uh, a colleague uh, who has been working a lot on this project uh, as well, and Giulia Valentini, uh, who is sitting here uh, next to me and uh, who has also made sure that everything went uh, smoothly from uh, a tech uh, perspective. So thank you very much to all of you for your immense efforts uh, that you have all invested into making this event a reality. Uh, and that all worked so uh, smoothly. A uh, big thank you also to all the interns. There are too many to uh, to mention, but uh, you know uh, who I mean. And uh, thank you also to you for having contributed to the success of this uh, event. Now, we hope that today's event will encourage uh, further assessment of the convention, in particular also in states that have not yet joined the convention. Because as I said in my uh, opening words, it's about time that this important uh, convention uh, really can unfold its full potential. And there is still a long way to go uh, before uh, we see the convention uh, unfold its uh, full potential. So I, if I may, you know, continue to count on all uh, your support and involvement and uh, efforts in encouraging uh, other states uh, to join the convention and to have children benefit from uh, the protection that the convention uh, offers. And so we very much look forward to continuing any discussion in support of these efforts with any relevant uh, authorities. So thank you for being with us uh, today. It was a delight to have you with us uh, on this milestone anniversary. 
I hope you enjoyed the series of videos as much as I have. And uh, if you want to watch the replay of today's event, including uh, the panel uh, discussion, all of that uh, has already been uploaded on uh, the HCCH YouTube uh, channel. The panel discussion uh, will be uploaded uh, shortly again for uh, you know, um, a, a wider audience uh, to also benefit from uh, your most uh, meaningful contributions to today's uh, discussions. I hope that you are now inspired to join us as we look forward to the future with the HCCH 1996 Child Protection Convention um, looking into the next 25 years. Uh, and I'm certainly with you on that, Rachel, uh, for as long as it takes. Um, and on that happy note, um, I thank you all again. And I don't know if I hand back to Harry or Jerry, but in any case, a big, big thank you.